I think for the first few minutes, so I'm just kind of going over these intro slides. Um, but after the introduction, we'll kind of dispense with this PowerPoint and go into the videos and the PowerPoints that other colleagues um, have sent in and then have more of an open discussion. So we can officially start. Uh, my name is Carrie McBroom. I'm the Site Management and Site Development Coordinator here in Cox Bazaar, uh, running the CCCM coordination mechanism for the Rohingya response. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, today, the goal is to kind of have a clinic where we can discuss um, actual HLP issues that are happening in different camps and settlement contexts that we work in and have the uh, amazing opportunity to pose questions and to get guidance from um, some lovely HLP experts that we have with us here today. So I will introduce you, hopefully your cameras are on and you can give a wave. We have Evelyn Arrow, who is the uh, ICLA Information Counseling and Legal Assistance Regional Advisor for East Africa for the Norwegian Refugee Council. We have Ibere Lopez, who is the HLP advisor to the Global Shelter Cluster. We have Rhoda Kadama, who is an HLP advisor with IOM in Nigeria. Jim Robinson, who's the HLP Area of Responsibility uh, Global Coordinator with NRC. We have Deepika, who is my dear colleague here in Cox Bazaar with the HLP Technical Forum. And we have Manasa Reddy, uh, who is the ECLA specialist for the Siri response in, uh, for NRC. So thank you all so much for being here. I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Patricia, who's on another session, and Gad for their technical help with everything as well. So like I said, this is a clinic. It's a space for brainstorming, for asking questions. So feel free to jump in at any time. We're a pretty small crew, so we can actively use the chat, but also feel free to speak in, speak up whenever. So because I don't know everyone's kind of familiarity with HLP here, I'm gonna give a really, really quick and dirty introduction to what we mean by HLP. So we're all starting from the same foundation and that pun is intended for the housing rights fans. Um, and then um, after that, we're gonna, I'm just briefly gonna take a look at how kind of CCCM and HLP typically intersect. And then from there, we'll jump right into case studies from uh, Kenya, Cox Bazaar, Nigeria, South Sudan, and Syria, if we have time. And after each case study, there'll be a discussion between experts, who have already worked on these issues, uh, on these HLP issues in CCCM context, and then also an open discussion where we can all kind of uh, contribute. So without further ado, we can get moving. I guess I can put this in presentation mode. So housing, land, and property rights, HLP, uh, are three different kinds of rights that are all very closely related. Housing rights, of course, is the right to housing, but we don't just mean the right to have a shelter, means the right to dignified, culturally appropriate, affordable, accessible housing. And the main thing here that is important is, uh, especially in humanitarian context or for this conversation, is this uh, uh, concept of security of tenure, which basically means that people have a right to live free of the threat of constant eviction or to have protections from eviction. Um, when we're talking about the L in HLP, that is land rights. And there we have a complex set of statutory and customary norms that determine who can use the land, who can use the land for what, who's allowed on the land, who's not on, allowed on the land, what environmental protections are there on the land, when can the government take, the, take land, uh, who can pass land to one person from another. Um, a whole plethora of religious laws are also involved, customary laws. It's a very complex uh, web of, uh, of laws that, uh, complicate and I think make HLP kind of scary for anyone who is outside uh, looking to get in. And then last we have property rights, which are quite complicated to explain, which is probably why this is my least favorite subject in law school. But property rights, you can think of sort of as the rights over goods um, or uh, different types of owning land or things. So we're talking about enjoying things. That could be land, it could be a building on land, Marital property is a type of property that uh, has certain rights uh, associated with it. Um, that's also a really complex uh, area of law, of custom, and of religion as well. So I know that was really quick, but again, I just wanted to make sure that we're all kind of talking about the same issues and the same rights as we're moving forward with the case studies today. So these are important for humanitarian actors and especially for CCCM actors 
because land is often a driver of conflict. And it's important that we're not only aware of the context in which we're operating in, but also aware of how our actions or actions going around, uh, going on around us related to land can fuel or drive those conflicts further. Additionally, um, us CCCM practitioners who work in camps and camp-like settlements, those camps, those settlements, they impact the use of the land, <clears throat> excuse me. So that might mean that the government uh, is using the land in a different way, that there's environmental impacts, that the host community uh, has different or uh, less access to the land. There could also be big changes in the land market in terms of the value of land, in terms of if people were previously using the land for crops, um, it really changes the space if you have a camp or a settlement there. And then, of course, as humanitarian actors, we should work to protect those rights that I just outlined under housing, land, and property. We should ensure that our activities increase or at least protect the space for people to exercise their housing, land, and property rights. And of course, at the same time, that our activities don't uh, harm or decrease people's opportunities to exercise their housing, land, and property rights. So usually when we have these conversations, I don't know if any of you were at the um, global meeting last year um, about housing, land, and property and CCCM, we usually see the conversation revolving around getting more land. We need a larger camp, we need a larger settlement area, we need additional space, um, or we see a lot of conversation about securing tenure for individuals and households or uh, conversations about kind of general due diligence on housing, land, and property in humanitarian contexts. Um, and especially for the first one, usually the answer is, well, advocate with the government, advocate with protection actors. But we thought it would be a little bit, it would be interesting today to really kind of delve into that security of tenure in, in a specific way by looking at informal markets. So what do we mean by informal markets? Uh, one of the colleagues who I was talking to earlier thought that I was speaking about informal bazaars or shopping areas, which I think is, uh, it's funny, but it also points to a common issue as well uh, in HLP where we use a lot of technical or legal terms that don't necessarily translate easily into everyone's understanding. So when we're talking about informal markets, what we're looking at is buying land, selling land, renting land, uh, um, uh, and or renting shelters or space outside of legal or customary norms. But even that in itself is very contextual and will change a lot depending on where you are, what that sort of outside legal norms or outside customary norms actually means. But we thought that this would be a really interesting conversation to bring CCCM and HLP actors together on because in camps, we're faced with these issues on a daily basis. And there's not necessarily a clear response each time we we're faced with these informal markets. Um, how can we as CCCM actors help to ensure that people in an informal real estate market have security of tenure? How do we address eviction threats in these contexts, if we should at all? What, if any, are CCCM actors' duties to intervene if we know that there's an informal market going on or not to uh, intervene? or even to measure, monitor, and report on that. What risks are there for um, refugees or other displaced people, or even for our own teams? And what, us, what should CCCM actors look out for in these informal markets that will help us to provide better camp management and camp coordination services to beneficiaries? These are just some of the very basic questions that I know the CCCM practitioners have when looking at um, informal markets in camp and camp-like settings. So I'm gonna let us actually get to some of those questions and some of those issues right now uh, after that introduction. So like I said, we're going to have case studies from Kenya, Cox's Bazaar, Nigeria, and Syria. And um, that's it for the formal presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. And Gad, if you can please play the video from Kenya to get us started with that conversation, that would be great. Great. Um, is it working? We can see your screen, but not video yet.
My name is Safa Ahmed. I work for the Norwegian Refugee Council as a project uh, officer in our Dadaab area office. I work as a project officer for the ICLA department, that is information counseling and legal assistance. Refugees in Kenya are located small, small plots of land at the beginning of our displacement crisis, and yet they mainly reside in camps despite um, despite recent developments around Kalubi settlement. As their families expand, their livelihood demands increases as well as their basic needs. Uh, and they, this often force, force them to seek additional resources to complement humanitarian assistance in order to sustain their families. And yet despite uh, these changes in family size, the plots are not increased by the Refugee Affairs Secretariat, that's RAS. And so the refugee, the refugee camps end up being overcrowded, increasing tensions uh, between refugees themselves, and in other instances uh, between refugees and the host community. The lack of clarity around housing, land, and property transactions in, in, in the camps in Kenya has resulted in informal land markets, where land transactions take place both between the refugees themselves and in other cases between refugees and uh, host community. Due to the informal nature of these uh, transactions, refugees are particularly at risk due to their displacement status and often get exploited, and in other instances, sell off their property at such low prices, especially when they're returning back home. Uh, in other circumstances, you know, in other instances, they do buy HLP assets at exorbitant prices, since the market is um, unregulated. Uh, this presents a need to ensure these land transactions are formalized in order to regulate the market and ensure these displacement affected communities are afforded the same protection as, um, as those of the host community. It is important to note that any refugee found engaging in illegal land transactions risk being um, detained and given their displacement status, they may uh, never access justice since the, crimin since the criminal justice system in Kenya it's, um, is already affected by a very heavy backlog. Thank you. Okay, great. So now, uh, now the idea is to sort of have a discussion about this uh, so the, and I'll hand it over to you, Evelyn, in just a second, but I just wanted to briefly summarize. So some of the main points were that there is limited space for a, uh, an increasing number of um, refugees, that the clarity on the market for renting and buying is not, the, is not regulated, or sorry, yeah, it's not regulated. You have sales between refugees and refugees and between refugees in the host community. And then you also have cases of refugees selling land or other property kind of as a coping mechanism for their, uh, to, to make up for their lack of uh, services or assistance. And then finally, and something that I think is really interesting is there's also a really big risk to refugees who might be caught engaging in these illegal transactions because of their, uh, their status and they could even face detention. So Evelyn, I think it would be really interesting to hear from you a little bit on um, on some of the actions that you've already taken and some of the challenges that might still be outstanding. And then we can open it up as well for comments from other colleagues before uh, moving on to the next case study. So over to you, thanks. Thank you, uh, Kerry. And as you've heard, I think the, the legal and policy framework around land transactions for displacement affected communities is unclear. So you'll find that according the law is, is, is blind uh, in terms of what to do when you are displaced, how to acquire or transfer property. But then in practice, uh, the property actually reverts back to the refugee affairs secretary, that is the camp manager. So what we have done uh, on ground in, in, in Kenya, specifically the Dab and Kakuma camps, are now extending into the Kalobeye uh, settlement. We have worked with the refugee affairs secretariat uh, and ensure that we do bilateral, we hold bilateral advocacy uh, sessions with them, very quiet advocacy because the government as a, a camp manager 
is a very difficult position for us to engage with. So our camp manager here is not, let's say, IOM or DRC, it is the government. So we have to use quite uh, advocacy based on the evidence. So this advocacy yielded results uh, last year. Of course, it, the, the progress of this work has been affected by COVID, but we have standard operating procedures that we have developed uh, together with, led by the Refugee Affairs Secretariat. And these um, standard operating procedures looks at housing, land, and property holistically. It also addresses some of the very sensitive issues that would be very uncomfortable uh, discussing with government officials. That is the informal markets. Not looking at it as informal markets, but using evidence from the illegal land transactions that they are actually happening. So whenever there is a return, we have also used pictorial evidence uh, to show that whenever there is a return convoy that has been earmarked for return to Somalia from the DAB, if you uh, visit the, the, the camps during the day, maybe two days before the departure, you will find that the structures are still looking uh, well constructed. They have every fixture, windows, doors in touch, in intact. But when you return after, when you visit the same settlement or camp after the return, after the return process of the convoy has left, you'll find missing windows, dismantled buildings. And so we had a field visit with the authorities to say we need to address this so that we can actually uh, formalize these transactions. The advocacy is still ongoing, it's work in progress, but uh, a lot of this re remains uh, work in progress. The other is that we've also noticed that vulnerability when it comes to HLP within the context of informal land market is also different. It's not about being unable to afford. Actually, some of the people that are unable uh, to transfer their HLP assets and investments because the displacement has been protracted since 1990 and there is no more prima facie uh, status for Somali refugees. So they have adopted different coping mechanisms. Some of them have invested in businesses, they have bought uh, uh, franchises with uh, Coca-Cola, with Safaricom, and they have huge businesses in the DAB. So they have acquired property. Because they are able to actually transfer that property to a local Kenyan national who cannot afford, because these camps are also sometimes set up in areas where people have very low income or very impoverished communities. Because they are unable to transfer, they are then unable to actually make a decision to return. So they are stuck in Kenya, defeating the overall durable solution uh, process, but then they also need to be able to transfer because they can't even transfer illegally because this is, these are huge uh, businesses. So advocacy, beyond advocacy, real programmatic approaches and using evidence to influence policy reform. The refugee bill is, is still in parliament, but nothing has also been done around these transactions. So we are also looking at the devolution in Kenya because their administration is decentralized. So trying to look at the county level government and see if they can have a county level policy so that at the Dab County and Kakuma, we are able to enforce what is actually applicable and also what is feasible uh, and implementable at that level. So that is quickly what we have tried to do, but like I mentioned, it's still work in progress and it's a very difficult piece of work. Thanks, Evelyn. That was really uh, useful. And I think mainly it shows how complex these issues are and that there are no easy solutions and that advocacy will be a part of uh, whatever strategy partners um, implement wherever they are. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has follow-up questions for Evelyn. I did want to quickly ask about the SOP that you mentioned. Um, uh, is that an, uh, can you maybe describe a little bit more about what exactly the SOP is for? If that's directed, if it's an SOP for um, humanitarian partners, if it's an SOP for the government, um, and exactly kind of what the SOP speaks to, because that maybe uh, could be something that would be useful for colleagues on the call. And then we also have um, a question from Jim in the chat about what you would like to specifically see in the policy. I think maybe he's talking about either the uh, legal reform more broadly or about the county level. So if you can just take a couple of questions to answer or a couple of minutes to answer those questions. Um, and yes, and then Jennifer is also asking about specific roles for camp managers. Uh, 
in these uh, tricky situations as well. So um, th for those three questions, uh, role of camp managers, a little bit more about the SOP and exactly who the SOP uh, uh, is targeted to, and then what are some of the major changes that you would like to see uh, in, in policies. So back over to you, thanks. Thank you, Kerry. So in terms of the SOPs, the SOPs are broad, so it cuts, it's very different from what you would see in an ordinary humanitarian setting where we're looking at HLP. So it looks at housing, land, and property across, across the board. So both humanitarian development and local actors, including governments, so even state actors. So it also defines some of the key terminology uh, that is used, but also it simplifies uh, the technical term that usually surrounds HLP. So kind of simplifying using words like housing and moving beyond, moving away from using shelter, using the, the very humanitarian kind of description of what HLP looks like, but looking at the different issues and it's very evidence-based. So looking at what conflicts mean, what land transactions mean, uh, defining sale, defining transfer, defining groups, defining, looking at it from a displacement affected communities point of view, looking at host community and looking at uh, uh, host community and displaced communities, but also being inclusive with a rights-based approach. So, and also the clearly uh, stipulating roles and responsibilities uh, of each of the actors and kind of clustering them uh, clustering them but also clustering the roles and also looking at roles that cut across the board without using the word mainstream so and also it has uh, a provision for it being updated uh, annually and uh, it is a living document and it's also led it's government owned it's owned by the refugee affairs secretariat and endorsed by the county government for sustainability and also for ownership and that has given it a lot of acceptance and we think that those standard operating procedures will be a key document in influencing policy so in terms of policy when you look at the land laws in kenya they are very rich uh, and also if you look at the constitution it's also very rich uh, in terms of rights that the citizens have but when you look at the refugee uh, the refugee act now it's being amended it's a refugee bill it's very silent on land and yet we know that land uh, transactions are taking place and land is also an issue because even the humanitarian assistance is actually on land. So because it's silent on land, we want to see the, uh, the, the county governments adapt provisions of the Land Act and make sure they're incorporated uh, in the Refugee uh, Act or bill or make reference uh, to it borrowing from countries like Uganda where refugees have the same right, rights as those enshrined in the constitution for citizens. And then that means it directly, you don't have to have a specific provision, it will just be subject to legal interpretation, but maybe you can have a county level policy or, or, or bylaw that can be relied upon. So not really changing the entire refugee law, but changing provisions to incorporate certain rights that then extend to refugees. So that's what we'd like to see. Then in terms of the roles of the camp manager, uh, the roles of the camp manager are not your usual camp management role because the camp management, uh, the, the refugee affairs secretariat is the camp manager uh, for refugee camps in Kenya. It works uh, closely with UNHCR, but it has a very, it is uh, the final decision maker for lack of a better term. So most of what they sometimes do in practice is also very much influenced by the politics surrounding displacement in the country because they're also a government body. So the roles are not clearly defined. All we know is that the camp management is under the Refugee Affairs Secretariat and it is also uh, stipulated in the Refugee Act, but there is, the, there is a disconnect between what the refugee law provides in terms of the role of the Refugee Affairs Secretary and what is in practice. Sometimes it's implemented and it's also sometimes linked to personalities and their experience actually working on refugee matters. If, for example, the commissioner is deployed from the military, that is different if he's also deployed from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. So it's, it's complex, it remains unclear, and I think that is something that also the broader refugee bill should be looking into. 
Thanks, Evelyn. That, those are really comprehensive answers to the questions. Um, I think that this component of having the government as the camp manager probably puts pretty tight restrictions on what CCCM humanitarian actors can do in that context as well, which is interesting. I think this is also uh, just an in interest of time and getting to the other case studies in the next 30 minutes, an interesting segue into the Cox Bazaar um, example where you do have uh, you have government administrator, camp administrators in the camp on a daily basis, but also CCCM actors in the role of camp managers uh, directly involved sometimes in monitoring or dealing with or doing relocations uh, related to these informal markets. So Gad, if you could queue up the presentation from uh, Cox Bazaar, the PowerPoint with the video, and everybody hope that this works. We're thinking. And, And keep the questions coming in the in the chat, please. Um. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Um, this is Connie, IOM Site Management Area Coordinator in uh, Cox Bazaar. So I'm going to share a bit of our uh, challenges in, um, in the Cox Bazaar camps uh, related to HLP. Um, just a bit of overview, um, over 860,000 uh, Rohingya refugees are living in 34 congested camps in Ukiah and Teknaf. And these are located in, um, in a 6,291 acre uh, land where 77% uh, percent are owned by the forest land or the forest department and the rest are cash land or private land. When we say cash land, it's a state-owned land awarded to to land uh, landless people or landless Bangladeshi uh, families for the purpose of livelihood. So, if you see in, uh, encircled in the map is the Ukiah camps. It's mainly uh, forest land. So, any expansion or construction must be approved by Forest Department through the Triple RC office, and uh, the government of Bangladesh is restricting to humanitarian agencies to construct uh, permanent or, or even semi-permanent structures. So uh, shelters are all uh, made of tarpaulin and bamboos and offices are, are like uh, most, uh, mostly are, are very temporary in nature. So while in Technaf camps, if you see in the map, it's the southernmost, uh, the southern uh, camps in Cox Bazar. Where, where Rohingya and host community live together. It's a mixed, very mixed population. So um, this is where the, the, the land are owned by private individuals. So more than 50% of the Rohingya are paying rent uh, and ranges from 28 uh, USD to $168 um, dollar per year. So for, for challenges uh, that our teams and uh, we are experiencing in the field, uh, one of this is the unregulated rental rate. So there is no rental agreement practiced. So that means they, that the landowners can easily increase the, the rental rate. So there's always risk to eviction because, uh, because of the fact that there is no, no security or agreement. And this eviction uh, results to increase in shelter or wash facility requirements which is not uh, within the regular programming. Uh, GBV cases uh, were also reported um, by the Rohingya women, tension between host and Rohingya, delay in site improvement works because uh, some landlords are controlling the design of the projects and having them agree to certain land improvements without any incentive is usually uh, difficult. Um, there's also reported extortion uh, and of course for the cash land, many Bangladeshi families livelihood was disrupted when government of Bangladesh opened camps uh, using the cash land. Um, 
what has been done so far, uh, we engage with uh, with uh, government authorities in, in all levels and we advocate for inclusive response so whose community will receive support as well. Um, we provide cash for work to Rohingya so they can pay rent. Uh, now we are getting support also from HLP uh, task force in negotiating with landlord. And I'm going to leave some questions uh, to, to our uh, HLP experts, which for now, this three question, uh, site management often confronted with difficult situation in, you know, deciding suitable land for relocation. What is the best approach or tool to use? Um, site management is guided by the principle, do no harm, but of course, it's always best when there is a proper tool. Um, landowners who want to deal with humanitarian uh, agencies not with Rohingya and us facilitating means we are also responsible in many ways to medi to, me to mediate or you know mediation when there is dispute etc so is it is it uh, good that we engage or should we should we have uh, let HLP engage the you know the, the, the host community the landlord so is, is there also a possibility that HLP be mainstreamed in CCCM yeah, these are the three questions from my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Connie. It looks like you're also here with us now, which is great, uh, given the time in the Philippines where you are. So uh, thanks for being here with us as well um, tonight. So I think um, one thing that Connie's presentation really highlighted was all of the risks that the refugees living in the camps face in negotiating and navigating this informal market, ranging from evictions to GBV, uh, if they can't pay rent, to extortion, to increased tension with the host community, um, and then even getting to the point where landlords are able to really affect even humanitarian projects or infrastructure projects where they don't want certain projects to move forward on their land or they ask for something in return. So I think it would be, um, I know Deepika is also here with us and it's important to mention that we've only had an HLP technical forum in Cox Bazar for uh, the past year, despite the, the land challenges that have been going on for a long time. So I'm not sure Deepika, if you want to jump in, but I think it would also be really great to hear from uh, the other HLP experts as well about how they see camp managers and site managers role in terms of mediating these disputes um, uh, and, and negotiating and how um, in a context where HLP is quite new and has very limited resources in terms of from the coordination or implementation standpoint, we can start to in mainstream HLP in a meaningful way in camps. So Deepika, maybe I'll pass it over to you to get the conversation started, or maybe even to articulate uh, the questions that I just said in the clear way, and then we can open it up to additional uh, comments. So over to you. Thanks, Deepika. Terry. Oh, there you are. Yes, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so just echoing what um, Terry and Connie have said, um, it's, it's quite challenging for us in Cox's Bazaar because particularly we have uh, very limited HLP service providers here and the need is so huge. We have to cover 34 camps and like Connie said, a uh, majority is on forest land and the remaining are on um, CAS, which is state land and private land itself. So the government in 2018 declared 8,000 acres as refugee settlement, but as Connie said, there is not just forest land, but there's private and land inside it. So a lot of the arrangements that has happened has happened informally. And the challenge we have is when there is, you know, issues happening within or there's disputes and we do have to look for suitable land, they are either they themselves are negotiating with the host communities or humanitarian agencies have had to negotiate with the host communities. But what's happened and what we have found out is that a lot of the land that has been offered are you know, really prime arable agricultural land where a lot of the, uh, the farmers are depending on for subsistence agriculture. And they're saying, look, we, we might be earning a lot more from renting this land to the refugees. Uh, so we want to rent it out, but then it affects themselves because they depend on this land for their subsistence agriculture. So there's that, that as well. How do you then, uh, you know, support these sort of negotiations that are happening and when humanitarian actors are involved in this, obviously you have to do due, due diligence and then when you do do that, you do come across that they might not have 
you know, they might have occupied certain land and then you're sitting there trying to negotiate rental agreements itself as well. So there's that complicated issue around that as well. And I think I'm also looking forward to other HLP experts to also um, assist us with also trying to mainstream HLP across the CCCM, but also in general, um, you know, how do we go about doing that? And some of the few things that we do want to do is obviously to start mapping and land tenure arrangements in the different camps, but also trying to, you know, slowly going about trying to in, uh, have an inventory of the number of uh, vacant or abandoned or demolished um, shelters or land that are available inside the camp. So we don't have to constantly have to negotiate to other people, but maybe it's something we can negotiate among ourselves, but that would take a a lot of work between CCCM or site management, shelter, um, and HLP partners as well. But um, I, I want to throw it back to my colleagues to see how we can also address these sort of issues. Thanks. Thanks, Deepika, for summarizing some of those issues. I do think that this kind of question about um, the informal nature of the rental agreements, and I mean, sometimes they are formal also, but if, if there are certain risks attached with formalizing those, not only if, if CCCM is helping to guide those or protection actors are, but what some of the risks might be in, in terms of formalizing those rental agreements, that might be something interesting to hear from other practitioners on. Um, or also just to hear kind of when, uh, when, if, you know, Connie outlined some pretty serious protection concerns and some pretty serious risks that definitely merit taking steps to attempt to resolve. But I'm also just wondering if colleagues have experiences from other contexts or good HLP advice about when, when is sort of the tipping point of when uh, camp managers should get involved, whether that's just in monitoring, recording, or reporting, or going the next step and attempting to mediate these. If anyone has kind of any experiences on that. I think the presentations and the information we're getting shows that, of course, the the this isn't gonna be resolved uh, in the next uh, five minutes or before we move on to the case study. But I think opening it up for a few um, best practices or even additional questions to help with our thinking or guidance would be really helpful. Does anyone want to be brave and jump in? Hi, Terry, I can jump in. Uh, uh, sure. I can say a few Evelyn, words after that, Evelyn. Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. So Evelyn and then over to Mana. So. Okay, yes. Thank you, Kerry. So uh, due diligence is very important, but I think that camp managers should be involved at the beginning, at the onset. So sometimes they're involved midway when the transactions have already taken place. So I think it's important that also uh, risk assessments are actually taken uh, to understand the context. I just shared an example uh, in Kenya. Uh, those risk assessments could inform the kind of information that we provide to these displaced communities as they come, because there's a lot of focus sometimes on access to essential and basic services and also on other aspects, but they need information based on the risk assessments that we've conducted. So, for example, in Kenya, you're not, it's illegal to engage in land transactions. So if you have that information, you already know that it's illegal and you know the consequences. And then formalizing of land tenure arrangements, it's not just about formalizing it. Sometimes the risks around formalizing it, if it's not permitted, is that there is evidence for you to actually be detained uh, or incarcerated but also not all formal agreements should be written. And I think that is what some, some of the things that people must understand. It doesn't have to be in writing. Sometimes it can be through testimonies, uh, it can be through witnesses, and then this can also be uh, chained with a, a district resolution mechanism mm -hmm. so that we also understand what mechanisms are in place uh, for dispute resolution and most of those mechanisms are multi-purpose for lack of a better term they do so many things so sometimes those mechanisms can also be used to witness these formal land transactions without having them in writing but knowing that they will have institutional memory and then when it comes to disputes they can actually be used to resolve these disputes because what happens is when you form you enter in an agreement to harvest to to, to plant there is a different uh, reaction when the harvest is ripe and that itself, uh, the informality then starts to play up at that time. Because now it was informal, then the landowner says the farm belongs to me because he's seen what kind of harvest. 
the same with business premises. So over to you. Uh, thank you for those suggestions. I think that this idea of sort of linking them up to different uh, dispute resolution mechanisms that can witness them or have some sort of accountability on the agreements if they're there is interesting. Um, it could be difficult to translate into the Cox's bizarre context, but I do think it's a really good starting point for a conversation. I think it would be really great if maybe we can get a copy of that uh, that list that we can share as a sample with partners as well. I also wanted to mention Ingrid, uh, capacity sharing to the end, brought up capacity sharing on HLP for camp managers as well. I think that would that makes a lot of sense, especially when we're talking about doing the basic CCCM training for camp managers, that that is something that we can weave in there. Um, Ibire, over to you for your comments on, uh, as well. Yeah, just um, just a quick comment on the on the Cox Bazaar uh, context. I think um, you know all those informal arrangements that are happening. They're happen they're happening for a reason, right? So the people are getting to uh, compromises and and give and take, and the, it's very hard to to come up with a, a red line and say. Uh, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that, uh, because this, these arrangements, uh, they are there and they're, they're occurring naturally. But it, I, think you're going on, uh, I think Deepika is going in the right direction, which is to, to catalog and, and understand what these arrangements uh, uh, are and, and what their consequences are and what, what, what are the, the, the negative effects of them. And if they are that bad, then, then we have to intervene. So what I'm saying is um, redlining is, is difficult um, because you're going to break through all these informal arrangements that, that exist for a reason. They, there's a balance there. And you know, if you intervene too harshly, you might break that balance and cause conflict. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, establishing a hard uh, red lines is a powerful tool for organizations. It's a form of collective actions from the organizations which allows us to, for example, say, we won't negotiate uh, any of us, right? And this is, this is uh, it's, it's not an easy decision to make and it has, has to be made in, collectively, but also has to be made regarding, uh, on the basis of, of what you find when you do your research and when you find out what this, uh, what this individual arrangements are and if they are um, negative enough, bad enough that we have to intervene in, in that way. The other thing I wanted to just uh, throw out there is if you talk about checklists and, and um, this um, uh, checklist for rental agreements, there's also an opportunity to create uh, a list or a catalog of procedures for SOPs. So it's very hard to come up with a general SOP for CCCM and HRP because as you say, as you see, you can, you can see there's so many different contexts and situations and things that we want to do or don't want to do. But um, what we can come up with, because if we try to come up with general with guidelines, it would be so generic that we will be just common sense, and then there's no point in doing that. But if you, uh, what you can do is just come up with a menu or a catalog of different procedures, different guides, uh, different guidelines that can be pick and chosen by the different uh, organizations, by the different contexts, by different countries. And by different situations so it's just a tool that the different missions can use to build their own SOPs so those are the, the two points I wanted to make great thank you very much uh, another uh, colleague joining from a uh, time zone far far away so we really appreciate you being here especially in terms of, of for sharing those really valuable points I think creating this sort of almost like a table of contents of different tools or approaches that partners can use and then contextualize uh, is a really great idea. I don't know if it's something that we can put down as an action point uh, for an invisible or a to be determined group of people to work on, but I think that it's something really interesting and um, that is, is something that we should work on developing. And I think this idea of red lines is also uh, very interesting to explore and would obviously need a lot of buy-in from partners, but it is, I think, especially when the protection concerns get to be so high, it is something important to keep on the table. So thanks again for those contributions. We are running a bit short on time, and I do really want to give the colleagues, especially from Nigeria and South Sudan, um, a chance to at least present the cases uh, in the next couple minutes. 
So I will hand it over to Kazi from, uh, from Nigeria to quickly outline some of the HLP challenges that the, the CCCM teams are facing, facing there. So uh, Kazi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Uh, since we are running out of time, I'm going to rush uh, the issues that we are facing here when it comes to HLP in Nigeria. Uh, you should know that in Nigeria, most of the, our site, the majority of the site are informal settlements, and usually the landowners are private. So most of the cases that we have in regards to HLP in Nigeria uh, are concentrated in these sites. So let me just run through some of the issues that we are facing. One, it has to do with uh, false evictions. And these false evictions are due to a variety of reasons. First of all, you have uh, landowners selling their lands to other parties without even the consent of the IDPs. So the new owners of the land will just come one day and evict everybody uh, in the site. So this is one issue that uh, we are facing. Another is the issue of uh, rent. Uh, the landowners have this informal arrangement with the IDPs where they pay them monthly or sometimes yearly rent and the price is not fixed. It can be uh, $2, it can be $5, uh, it can be $10, depending on maybe what the landowner feels the IDPs can afford. And over time, we have issues of uh, evictions because the landowners cannot really sustain this arrangement. And another issue is also that is tied to force eviction is the issue of illegal squatters. Like I said earlier, most of our site, majority of our site are informal self-settled sites. So sometimes illegal squatters come into a site, whether it's uh, an empty land or there is uh, an empty building there, they just occupy the building. And after some time, the legal occupants will come back and they have to be evicted because they don't have any uh, security of tenure. And there are also issues of landowners selling their lands to uh, multiple uh, buyers. This is an issue that currently we're trying to solve in one of the states uh, in Northeast Nigeria. Uh, so these are some of the issues that in Nigeria we face as CCCM uh, camp managers. And also tied to that, I know it has been highlighted by the colleague in Bangladesh, but sometimes there are also restrictions on what you can do uh, on the land. For example, the landowner might allow you to use the land, but he will restrict the kind of structures that will be constructed. Uh, what we've been having issues with here in the Northeast is mostly uh, the wash structures. They can allow you con to construct shelters, but wash uh, like the latrines and the uh, toilet uh, uh, and the showers, they don't allow that. So as CCCM, when we have cases like this, usually we either go to the government or we deal directly with the HLP working group. And in some instances that they negotiate with the landowners and IDPs are allowed to stay for a certain duration until a more durable solution is, is found. Uh, so thank you. Uh, my colleague Rhoda can add something. Hello, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation, Kazi. Um, in addition to what he has um, just presented, is that um, currently IOM concentrates most of its program within camp settlements. And these camps are managed by the CCCM unit here in IOM in conjunction with the government um, agencies like the State Emergency uh, Management Agency, the National Emergency Management Agencies, and the local government authorities. Those put together usually are the authorities that regulate all land related issues within the state and the um, local government levels. So as for the HLP market, it remains highly unregulated. It's a free market where people can easily go in and um, transact, largely because most of these transactions are carried out informally. However, there are statutory guidelines for land acquisitions, either by way of um, sale or other forms of acquisition. But statutorily, there are guidelines for those kind of um, procedures for acquiring property. So like Kazi had rightly mentioned, some of the HLP issues were beginning to um, 
notice and are being reported even at the sector level, the HLP sector level, is the issue of IDPs who are trying to integrate here within um, their places of displacement are being um, short changed in uh, issues of uh, security of tenure. Most of them don't know the right procedure to follow for the acquisition of this property. Hence, most of them are end up um, being vulnerable and at risk of um, fraudulent transaction. One notable incident is where um, a landowner sold a property to three different IDPs. And then upon discovery, we, we, uh, they, there was really nothing much they could do. They tried to settle it at communal level with the district heads and all of that. So when it was flagged at the sector level, some of the steps we took is um, to develop a tool we call the SOP for um, land acquisition in urban areas. The targeted beneficiaries still remains the IDPs and then the uh, people living within the host communities that are not very literate. However, one of the challenges we're having currently is that this tool has been developed in English language and education and language, the English language has constantly remained a barrier. So we're trying to see how we can translate this um, tool into various other languages for the people that are literate enough to read in their local language. And also we're considering radio jingles and the pro radio programs and television programs to see that the um, right beneficiaries are reached with this information. So it's basically an information sharing uh, method. And also um, organizations- Rhoda, I'm really, really sorry, but I need to cut you off because we have only one minute left and I guess we can't Thank you. Uh, extend. So Thank you I really much. appreciate that. And I think, I think that the last point you brought up is something really, really important that we hadn't touched on yet. And that is about translating our conversations on this, not only into the literal language that the communities are speaking, but also um, you know, in a way that it is, not, is not very legally in a way that uh, makes sure that we're having an ongoing dialogue with the community about this as well. Um, I'm really sorry to Richard from, from South Sudan who and to Manasa because we didn't have time for your case studies. But I think that we were able to take a good look at some of the issues that happen in camps themselves, outside of camps, identify a few, uh, well, many, many, many common challenges that we're facing across diverse contexts and across diverse types of uh, CCCM interventions as well. Oh, this countdown clock is extremely unnerving. Um, but, and, and I'm already a fast talker, so we're really screwed. But uh, I think that we've identified really interesting issues across contexts, and now I'm getting the boot from the team here as well, um, and some good action points that we can take, uh, take moving forward. I think the biggest takeaway is that HLP is complicated and messy and really, really hard to, um, to address uh, quickly. And so it's important that we continue to have these conversations and it's, continue, it's important. I don't wanna say that we should be patient because we need to do the work, but um, it's, uh, we need to make sure that we're uh, being realistic about we, what we can and cannot achieve in these extremely complicated and messy scenarios. And now I still have seven seconds left and I feel like I need to fill it. I wanna thank all of you for being here, especially our experts, Patricia and Gad,